so here we have the uh, four tissue types in the human body. Um, believe it or not, every organ and every part of the body is made up of some combination of these four tissues. Now, a lot of these tissues have many subtypes, um, but when it comes down to it, every tissue in the body can be broken down into one of these four types. So, uh, the first type we have is epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue, its basic role is going to be to cover organs and line cavities. Um, it's oftentimes very thin, and it serves as sort of a membrane that can absorb things, secrete things. It's, it's an interface tissue, a barrier. We also have connective tissue. Connective tissue probably is the most broad type of tissue. It contains all different types of tissues, even blood, bone, things like that. But in general, maybe perhaps with the exception of blood, but I guess it supports in a different way. But in general, connective tissue is a structural tissue that supports uh, the body. So bones support the body, tendons, ligaments support the body, uh, reticular tissue helps support um, different vessels and arteries. So connective tissue in general is a very supportive tissue. It even supports epithelial tissue, which we'll talk about on this next slide. Uh, third type of tissue, muscle tissue. That's pretty obvious what muscle tissue does. It moves things. That can be smooth muscle in the intestine that moves our food along. That can be our skeletal muscles, which literally move us, move our arms, legs, or a cardiac muscle that contracts and moves our blood. Lastly, we have nervous tissue. There aren't many subtypes of nervous tissue or, or any. There's actual nerve cells and then supportive tissues, but um, nerve tissue, its responsibility is to control a lot of the other tissues. Um, that innervates glands, which are epithelial tissues, it innervates muscle tissues to control how we move, when we move, to coordinate movement, and it uh, isn't responsible for our higher brain functions. So let's talk about epithelial tissue first. Like I was saying before, it covers structures and lines organs. Sorry, I said that the wrong way. It covers structures and organs and lines cavities. Um, it forms something called pleura, which we'll talk about later, but basically pleura covers organs, specifically visceral pleura covers organs, and parietal pleura covers um, the walls, the cavities. We'll talk about that later though. Right now, um, just want you to know that there's two types of epithelium. There's covering and lining epithelium, which we've been talking about, but there's also glandular epithelium. So all of the glands in our body are made up of epithelial tissue. And these glands can either be one cell or many or multiple cells. But again, we'll talk about that later when we get to glands. Uh, the epithelial tissue functions as an interface tissue. I mentioned this earlier. It, its function is to be a, an interface or a barrier between the body and outside of the body. And as an interface face tissue, it can serve to protect the body, um, like our skin is, protects our body. It can function to absorb things like the lining of our digestive system um, or our, our alveoli in our lungs. Uh, it can serve to filter things like in our kidneys. Um, excrete things. Well, we already mentioned how epithelial tissue composes glands, so they're going to excrete and secrete substances. And also, I spelled sensory wrong here, forgive me, but also uh, serves sensory roles in the skin. So epithelial tissue does many things, very broad, but in all of its functions, it's really an interface tissue. It's an interface between the body and the outside of the body. Okay, this is this is important here. Um, let's let's talk about some special characteristics of epithelial tissue. This first one here, polarity. Uh, don't let that confuse you. We talked a lot about polarity last week in cells, and we described it as being um, a cell or a membrane or even a molecule as having um, electrical poles. So one side was positive, one side was negative. So it had poles on it. It had a charge gradient across the structure. This is this is different. We're not talking about um, electrical gradients here. We're just talking about um, the actual structure of the cells in epithelial tissue. So the cells in epithelial tissue have an apical side or a free side, and then this picture left the top with all the microvilli and cilia. That is exposed to um, 
to the outside of the body or to, to the inside of some cavity like the stomach or the intestine. And then we have the basal part of the cell, uh, the basal region, which is the bottom part of the cell that's anchored, anchored to a basement membrane, to a basal lamina, which we'll talk about in a second. So because of this, the cell is said to, said to have an apical basal polarity, meaning that the cell has regions. It has an apical free exposed region and a basal anchoring um, bottom part of the cell, bottom region. Also, it has specialized contacts. We talked about this a lot last week. This is just the different types of cell junctions, the um, gap junctions and desmosomes, as well as the, uh, the tight junctions. So when we have an epithelial sheet lining the stomach, for example, these tight junctions are really important because it will keep, it will prevent the acidic contents of the stomach from leaching down into the basement, basement of these cells, the basement membrane. All epithelial tissue, remember, epithelial tissue is just um, tissue made up of epithelial cells. Um, epithelial tissue, it's like a sheet. It covers and lines things like we talked about. It needs to be supported by something, and in all cases, it's supported by connective tissue. So if you look down below, we see a basement membrane. Now, the basal lamina is actually secreted by the basal part of the epithelial cells, but that basal lamina is sitting on connective tissue. These two things to get together, the basal lamina and the reticular fibers, they're the basement membrane. So epithelial tissues sit on the basement membrane, and that helps give some structure and, and support. Here's, a, here's another very important thing, avascular but innervated. So avascular means there is no direct blood supply to epithelial tissue. Rather, the basement membrane is supplied with blood and then uh, nutrients and fluids and important things from the blood seep into the epithelial tissue. That can work in reverse too. If these cells are absorbing things from the stomach, these contents and digestive materials can then be absorbed down into the basement membrane and taken away in the capillaries. So there is no direct blood supply to the cells, but rather there's a, a vascularity in the basement membrane that collects these things in the connective tissue underlying this epithelial tissue. So avascular but innervated. Epithelial tissue is innervated. That just means there is a nerve supply. Um, for example, glands have a nerve supply so they, they know when to release things, etc. And lastly, and this is, this is probably pretty easy to, to see when you think about the skin, um, epithelial tissue has a regenerative capacity. So if anything happens to these uh, specialized contacts or this apical basal polarity or damage is done to the cell, as long as there is adequate nutrition from the underlying uh, blood supply in the connective tissue, um, epithelial tissues can regenerate and will continue to divide. All right, so there's um, some different types of epithelia. So far, all we, what we know about epithelia is that, sorry, my dog's in the background. Um, all we know about epithelia is that it is this covering, lining sheet of tissue. It's thin tissue that lines and covers things and acts as an interface tissue between the inside of the body and the outside. Or, or remember, the outside of the body can also be considered things like within the stomach and within the test intestine, because these are hollow organs that are continuous with the outside of the body. Um, if you don't understand that, we're going to talk about that later when we get to endocrine and exocrine glands. But basically, epithelial tissue lines cavities, lines the inside of hollow organs, as well as lining the covering the outside of organs. Okay, so there are two very general types of epithelial tissue. Simple epithelia and stratified epithelia. Um, I wish they just would have called this single layer and multi layer epithelia because that's really all it is. Simple epithelia is just an epithelial tissue that is only one cell layer thick. Okay, so capillaries are a good example, the air sacs in the lungs are good examples. Um, it's just some type of epithelial tissue that is only one cell thick. Now, you can imagine some of the roles of epithelia we talked about earlier, I want you to kind of start guessing what simple and stratified would be better at. Okay, so simple is a single layer thick, so it's probably not good at protection, it's probably better at absorption, secretion, 
um, filtration, things like that. And that makes sense when we see that it lines blood vessels and air sacs of lungs because we want gases and nutrients to pass easily through this epithelial layer. Stratified epithelia is just an epithelial layer that is more than one cell thick. Um, this is going to be better for things like protection and, and areas of uh, lots of abrasion like the skin. You're going to see a lot of stratified epithelia. Okay, that's, that's type, those are types of epithelial tissue. Um, but within each of those two types of tissues, there are different types of epithelial cells. Okay, and these are listed down here below. There are squamous or squamous uh, epithelial cells, cuboidal cells, and columnar cells. Um, squamous cells are going to be flat, almost, almost kind of like a fried egg. They'll have the nucleus is sort of flattened. And then the cytoplasm, the whole cell is just, it's flat, it's thin, but wide. Cuboidal are about as tall as they are wide. They're close to being a, a perfect cube. And then columnar are going to be um, tall, rectangular cubes, I guess I could say. They're columns, basically, square columns. Um, and we're going to see, we're going to see what each of these cell types uh, lends itself to. We can already kind of imagine, though, that these squamous cells especially simple squamous epithelia, so a, a single layer of squamous cells, be very good for permitting exchange of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs or um, wastes and nutrients across the capillary walls. Okay, but we'll, we'll take a look at each cell type as we go through. Um, this first type, simple epithelia. So we were just talking about this a little bit. Uh, simple epithelia. So there's going to be a few types of simple epithelia. The first type we're going to talk about is simple squamous epithelia, or a simple squamous epithelium. So look at that name. Simple, that means one cell layer thick. Squamous, it means it's one layer of squamous cells. Okay. So, that, so the name pretty much gives it all away. Now, the two, two really good examples, um, well, possibly... Not the only examples, but the, pretty much the main source, the, ma the main place you're going to find simple squamous epithelium are the lungs, air sacs in the lungs, um, as well as uh, lining, covering things, uh, covering the lungs, lining different uh, cavities, covering different organs, and then lining the inside of the vascular system. So... There's two types of simple squamous epithelia, the first being endothelium and the second mesothelium. Endothelium is what lines the entire cardiovascular system, and you can see that in this little picture here. Endothelium is going to line the arteries. Um, when we get out into the capillaries, that's all the capillaries are, simple squamous epithelium. Um, that's because that is the site of gas exchange and nutrient exchange. So the capillaries are just a simple squamous epithelium. But even in the bigger organs, in the, the hollow cavities of the heart, you'll find this endothelium covering the walls. Mesothelium, um, mesothelium is going to form pleura, or uh, it's not always called pleura, but it's basically going to form a single cell sheet that covers both the organ and lines the cavity the organ is in. This provides just a smooth, frictionless environment for organs to move around without, uh, without getting damaged or... Um, creating friction. So the, the, the pleura that covers or the mesothelium that covers the organ is called the visceral pleura or visceral mesothelium. The pleura that lines the cavity, that lines the thoracic cavity, or that lines the abdominal cavity is called the parietal pleura. And this, this tissue, this uh, mesothelium is, has different names in different regions and we'll, we'll talk about that more in lab. Okay, so we talked about simple squamous, simple squamous epithelium. That's going to be really good, um, like I was saying, for filtration, absorption, transfer of nutrients across across the membrane. Simple cuboidal epithelium is like simple squamous because it's one cell layer thick. The only difference being that it's made up of cuboidal cells instead of squamous cells. This tissue is also um, 
good for secretion and absorption because it's a single cell layer thick. Things can move across it easily. Uh, it's just slightly stronger and a little bit um, more structurally sound than the simple squamous epithelium. This, we're going to find this in the kidney tubules um, where a lot of absorption and filtration occurs uh, through a process we'll learn about later when we get to the urinary system. Um, but it's also, and it's also going to line ducts of glands. So simple cuboidal epithelium. Sorry, not sure what I did. I was trying to figure out the laser pointer, but anyways. So these cells are also going to be really good for absorption and secretion because it's a single, single cell layer. It's a simple epithelium, a simple columnar epithelium. Uh, this is going to have two modifications from the previous simple epithelial tissues that we talked about, uh, simple squamous and simple cuboidal. The difference is that there are microvilli. Okay, so if you look, if you look at the lumen of the intestine, where it says lumen of intestine, where digesting food would be, and you see this, the top of the cells, it's almost like kind of fuzzy. It even, and then it's even labeled, it says free surface with microvilli forming brush border. So this fuzzy area is called a brush border because there's all these little microvilli. This really increases the surface area of the cells, allowing them to absorb more nutrients. Um, simple columnar epithelia also has tubular glands called goblet cells and other types of glands which we'll talk about later, but that's what you see here labeled with goblet cell. That's going to release acidic mucus into the food, digesting food to help break it down so these other simple columnar cells can absorb these nutrients through their microvilli. There is a ciliated type. So there is a type of simple columnar epithelium that's ciliated, meaning instead of little microvilli, it has these longer, motile uh, cilia, which can move and beat and move things across their brush border. It's not called a brush border, but uh, in, in the ciliated type. This is going to line small bronchi, so in the lungs. So these cilia can move the mucus up and out of the respiratory system, and you cough it up. Uh, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, just, just simple columnar epithelium, remember, it's a single layer of columnar cells. Okay, It's still simple even though it's a tall, thicker membrane because it's just one layer of cells. Okay, this next type is sort of interesting. So this looks a lot like the previous type. It looks a lot like the simple um, columnar cells, but it, it looks stratified. It looks like there's a few layers. And it looks that way because I see nuclei at different levels. I see nuclei all over the place. Well, this is pseudo-stratified pseudo columnar epithelium, and notice it's still on a simple epithelial slide. So it still is simple epithelium. epithelium. It is not stratified, meaning multiple layers. It's one layer of cells. It looks stratified, stratified because while all of the cells are sitting on the basement membrane, they don't all reach the surface. Okay, so. In, in lecture, when I sh I'll show you a diagram where you can really see this. This picture is hard to tell. But a lot of these cells resting on the basement membrane, well, they're all resting on the basement membrane, but a lot of them don't make it to the free apical surface. They sort, they're sort of triangular. And then, and then these other cells do make it to the free surface, and they just kind of have a little piece of their cell membrane all the way down to the bottom resting on the basement membrane. Uh, these... These... Uh, Sorry, what am I trying to say? We're going to find these in the respiratory system. You can see the cilia on the, on the free surface. But the main thing I want you to know about this is that it is a simple epithelia. So if you see a picture of this on a quiz or a test and you see all these nuclei at different levels, it is a simple epithelia. This is the last type of simple epithelia we'll talk about. All right, so here we have our first type of stratified epithelium. You can see there's many layers, many layers. Uh, there only needs to be two technically to be a stratified epithelia, um, two or more. So there's going to be, this can get a little confusing because if you look at the basal cells, and this picture doesn't show it super well, but when you look at the cells resting on the basement membrane, they're going to be um, cuboidal or columnar. But we're talking about a stratified squamous epithelium, squamous epithelium. 
So the important thing with stratified tissue to realize is that the tissue is named for the apical surface. So whatever type of cell is on the apical free surface, in this case squamous cells, it's going to be named stratified squamous epithelium, even though its basal cells are cuboidal or columnar. Um, there's two different types of stratified epithelium. There's keratinized, keratinized stratified epithelium, and non-keratinized. Keratinized, basically the apical layer of cells is dead, and it's filled with a lot of keratin, and that's what's on the right here. Uh, these are going to, it's, you really can see the stratification here, these layers of cells. And these top layers are going to be dead and really um, filled with this keratin uh, protein, making them strong and water resistant. And that that's going to, that's what's going to compose our skin, the outer layer of our skin, our epidermis, is this keratinized um, layer of stratified epithelium. Now, this covers our entire skin and the just immediate regions of uh, any inlets into the body, for example, the mouth. So the very inside of your mouth will be covered in this. But then it will transition to this um, non-keratinized epithelium, which will line our esophagus in our, in our mouth. Uh, so keratinized outside, outside of the body, non-keratinized is going to line our esophagus and mouth. All right. Another type of stratified epithelia is transitional epithelium. This is really, really interesting, I think. It's going to line hollow urinary organs. So the ureters, the bladder, the urethra. Um, its basal layer, like stratified squamous, is cuboidal or columnar. Okay, but the apical cells vary in appearance based on degree of distension. So what does that mean? Okay, so our bladder, obviously, when it's empty, these cells look uh, like the cells on the right. They're kind of bulbous and round on top, on the apical layer. Uh, when our bladder is full, these cells will actually stretch and flatten. So in both pictures, you can see the individual cells are rounded and, wrink and it's, it's wrinkled up. This gives it the ability to stretch to hold more urine. Um, uh, oh, sorry, and here's the other thing. So right, right in these pictures, when it's um, not being stretched, it, it's about six cell layers thick. When it is stretched, it actually decreases the number of layers to give more volume. So it goes from about six layers to three layers when it stretches out to, to allow it to stretch quite a bit. So that that's it for a stratified epithelia. You might have noticed we didn't talk about stratified columnar or stratified cuboidal. They do exist, they're just very rare. Um, and so rare that your book doesn't even have any pictures or talk about them. So, so in recap, we've talked about three different types of simple epithelia, simple squamous or squamous. I haven't decided what I like better. <laughs> simple squamous epithelia, uh, simple cuboidal epithelia, simple columnar epithelia. And then we talked about um, stratified epithelia, only two types. We talked about stratified squamous epithelia, which is going to, which is, makes, makes up our skin and our esophagus and our mouth. It's many layers of, of squamous cells, so that's going to serve to um, protect and, and cushion and serve as a barrier to the external environment. And then we talked about transitional epithelia, which are the, it's this weird kind of tissue made up of, at the bottom, cuboidal or columnar cells, and, that, and then the cells on top are these kind of bulbous, weird cells. And it's about six cell, layer, six cell layers thick. This allows it to stretch, um, and that's really important in an organ like our bladder that needs to stretch to hold more um, volume. Okay, so... Those are the different types of epithelial sheets, of uh, different epithelial tissues. Now, that we're still talking about epithelial tissue, but we're going to be talking about glandular epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue. So, there's two types of glands, or there's several types, but there's two general categories of glands. Endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Um, endocrine glands are going to be ductless. They don't have a duct, and the reason is because they release their contents directly into the blood. So, they don't need a duct. 
and uh, exocrine glands, on their hand, are going to have a duct. So the sweat glands, the oil glands in our skin, they're going to have a duct to the external surface of our skin, a pore, some way to some way to release your contents out of the body. So the islet cells of the pancreas, which reduce insulin into the blood, are going to be an endocrine gland. The sebaceous oil glands of the skin and the sweat glands of the skin are going to be exocrine glands. So here, so what would be what would say a gob cell in your intestine be, or in your stomach? Well, most people would say endocrine glands because they're releasing their contents into the body. But an important thing to remember is that technically, our intestinal system, the, the lumen, the the hollow insides of our intestinal system, really aren't inside of our body. I mean, they are technically within our body, but it's like a tunnel going through a mountain. Both ends of the tunnel are exposed to the outside environment. So really, you're still outside of the body. So when glands release things into the stomach, they need to travel through a duct before they can do that, versus just releasing it into the bloodstream like an endocrine gland. Okay, so enough about that. Let's just, um, let's just talk about endocrine. Uh, glands in general. So glands are glands are either a single cell or a multicellular gland which release its contents. Um, they secrete a product. I said there's there's endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Again, endocrine glands are ductless and they produce hormones and they can be unicellular or multicellular. They can be single cell glands or multicell glands. All right. Um, endocrine glands do all kinds of things. They release all types of hormones and lipid-based compounds that regulate our growth, our metabolism, our, uh, our fight or flight response, our sleep, all different, our breathing, all different types of things that maintain homeostasis. We're going to talk all about this when we get to the endocrine system. Um, for now, I just want you to know that endocrine glands are ductless. They release their contents in, directly into the body, into the bloodstream, and they produce hormones. All right, exocrine glands. This is a really cool picture of a goblet cell here. Um, exocrine glands, there are unicellular exocr exocrine glands and multicellular, both of which have ducts. Okay, so the two most, uh, I don't, not famous, but the two most widely studied types of exocrine glands are unicellular exocrine glands are mucus cells, which line the respiratory tract and release mucus into the, into the lumen of the respiratory tract, and goblet cells, which release an acidic digestive enzyme filled mucus into our digestive system. Um, you can see this picture here. The the bottom of the cell, um, well, you can't really tell, but the bottom of the cell, there's all this Golgi appar apparatus releasing these secretory vesicles, okay? And that's all these little circles you see. And it makes so many of them that it gives the cell this goblet appearance. appearance. And then through exocytosis, the cell releases its contents, this gland, releases its contents into the lumen of the digestive tract. And that's called a goblet cell. I can't remember what I said earlier. I might have spoke too soon, but um, these single cell glands, they don't they don't have a duct. They just release directly outside of their plasma out, out of their plasma membrane into the lumen. So yeah, unicellular exoc exocrine glands will not have a duct. They're just single cells that release their contents from their plasma membrane, like this goblet cell is doing in this picture. Okay, so here we have um, multicellular exocrine glands. So these will be composed of several cells, and will have a duct. Um, they're going to have a duct and a secretory unit. So they're going to have many cells that secrete product, and then they're going to have a duct that funnels this product, to its desired destination. Um, there's two, I don't know if this pic, the picture in your book does a little bit better job, we'll sh I'll show it in lecture, but there's two very basic types of multicellular exocrine glands, simple and compound. So simple is going to have one, um, one general tube coming in. Sorry, that was a terrible way of saying that. Simple glands are just going to have one unbranched duct. Okay. Um, 
Compound glands, on the other hand, are going to have a branched duct. So they'll have a duct that comes in and gives off many branches, several branches. Uh, they can also be categorized not by only by their ducts, but by their sec secretory units. So they can be achinar or tubular, or another way of saying sorry, another way of saying this is they can be alveolar or tubular. Uh, and that's just referring to the shape of their secretory unit. So if we look at in this picture, if we look at B, we have a simple, meaning an unbranched duct, um, tubular gland. So it's, the secretory unit is tubular. If you look at E, on the other hand, we have a simple achinar, or simple, another way you can say it's a simple alveolar uh, gland. The secretory unit is bulbous, alveolar. On the bottom, we have compound glands, and we can see that the ducts are highly branched, and then they can be broken down into simple achinar, sorry, compound achinar or compound um, uh, compound alveolar or tubular, sorry. They can also be both. You can also have a compound tubulo achinar, or the book will say a compound tubulo alveolar, meaning that some of the secretory units are, are um, tubular and some of them are alveolar. Okay, epithelial is done. Now we're getting into connective. Um, connective, remember, connective tissue, its primary function is to support. It supports other tissues, organs, things like that. It is the most abundant tissue in the body. Um, connective tissue, there, there are four types. Actually, sorry, let me, before I get into that, let me, let me talk about the common character, characteristics of connective tissue. They all have a mesenchymal origin. This is referring to where in the early um, embryo, the early developing fetus, did this, does this tissue arise from? It arises from the mesenchyme. And that's one of the reasons why these tissues, some of these tissues which may not seem like connective tissue, like blood, for example, are uh, included as connective tissue because they all originated from the mesenchyme. Connective tissue is going to have varying vascularity. Things like ligaments have almost no vascularity, but other connective tissue has tons of vascularity, and some connective tissue is actually blood. So uh, vascularity is something that we can't really use to categorize connective tissue with because it's, it's highly variable. Here's the big, probably the biggest difference um, that all connective tissue has in common. Epithelial tissue, all the tissues we've talked about so far have had cells as their primary unit. The tissue is mostly made up of cells. Connective tissue, on the other hand, has an extracellular matrix that the cells are really responsible for maintaining. So this matrix is the main component. Um, and we'll talk about matrix here in, in the next slide. Oh, sorry, and before I get into this, I just want to remind to say that there are four types of connective tissue, four general types of connective tissue, which each have subtypes. Um, the first type is connective tissue proper, which we'll get to later. The second type is cartilage. The third type is bone or osseous connective tissue. The fourth type is blood. Okay, so let's look at the structural elements of connective tissue. Um, Again, there is this thing called an extracellular matrix in connective tissue, and that's composed of fibers, collagen fibers, elastin fibers, reticular fibers. This is going to give connective tissue structure. And it's also composed of ground substance, which is largely just proteins and water, um, things called gags and, and other types of com uh, complex proteins produce this viscous um, molasses-like matrix, which which has all these different fibers running through it, giving it support and structure. So it makes sense then why connective tissue is a stronger, more supportive tissue, because it's all these cells are basically swimming around in this cement with rebar-like structure, the, uh, the fibers acting as rebar and the, the ground substance acting as cement. And this ground substance and extracellular matrix is what really varies in different types of connective tissue, like blood, for example which uh, does have an extracellular matrix as plasma and serum and, and fibrin and different proteins floating around, and then blood cells as the cells within the matrix versus a ligament or a tendon, which is going to have tons of collagen fibers to give it strength and support, um, which, you know, which, obviously, which makes it very, very different than blood. So variance and differences in this extracellular matrix can have a huge impact on the type and the, of tissue in this properties of that tissue. 
all connective tissue is going to have cells, right? So these cells are are uh, going to be maintaining the extracellular matrix and serving other functions. Um, first type of cells are fat cells. So fat tissue or adipose tissue is a type of connective tissue. Uh, then we have white blood cells, and that these white blood cells are going to roam around the connective tissues. Remember, the connective tissues in a lot of a lot of times acts as a barrier uh, underneath the epithelial tissue. So we want to have lots of white blood cells there to prevent anything from getting through any types of bacteria or viruses. And there's all types of white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, um, different types of things. And then there's going to be mast cells, which mediate inflammation. They have, they release compounds like histamines and, think, and heparin to mediate inflammation. So if, if there is some type of injury or infection, they can, they can basically, uh, inflame the area to bring in more blood, more nutrients, more white blood cells, things like that. So connective tissue, again, being the most widespread tissue, is oftentimes in a good spot to support inflammation and some type of immune response. Uh, there's also macrophages. These swim around inside the extracellular matrix looking for bacteria, looking for things to eat um, and, and to protect the body from invaders. Okay, so specifically here now we're talking about the fibers in the extracellular matrix. Uh, three types, collagen fibers, these are very strong fibers with, with very little give. Okay, they're not, these aren't going to stretch a lot. Um, we also have elastic fibers, which will stretch and will rebound. So they can be stretched, but, they, but once that uh, tension is released, it will snap back into place. Then we have reticular fibers. These fibers are going to form uh, complex webs that will hold things in place, um, especially in reticular tissue and different types of tissues that, that hold uh, blood vessels and things. Um, we'll, we'll talk about these fibers more in their, in their specific tissue types. Okay, this is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to show you how the different uh, connective Connective tissues will have different primary cells. So connective tissue proper, which there's several types of, its primary tissue cell will be fibroblasts, and these produce the fibers. Um, so connective tissue proper is going to be a, very, a highly structural tissue because it's going to have all these fibers and fibroblasts, which are cells that produce and maintain fibers. Cartilage um, will have chondroblasts, which are chondrocytes, which are cartilage cells. They help produce the extracellular matrix and maintain it. Bone tissue will have osteoblasts and osteocytes. These release the, uh, the matrix that the calcium adheres to to make bone, and then osteocytes are mature osteoblasts, and they maintain that tissue. Blood, obviously, red and white blood cells, erythrocytes and leukocytes, and platelets for clotting. All right, so there are six types of connective tissue proper. That's what we'll be talking about first. And those six types are broken down into two general categories, loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. Within loose connective tissue, we have areolar, the most common type of loose connective tissue, adipose loose connective tissue, and reticular loose connective tissue. Uh, we also have dense connective tissue, which is made up of regular, irregular, and elastic dense connective tissue. Three types of cartilage, hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. Then we have bone and blood. So that looks like it's 11 different types of connective tissue. So there's, so there's, this is a pretty big category, and it is the most widespread tissue in the body. All right, loose connective tissue. The first type of loose connective tissue, and remember, loose connective tissue is falls within the connective tissue proper umbrella. Uh, the first type of loose connective tissue is areolar. So this is the universal packing tissue of the body. This packs and supports all of our organs and our um, epithelial basement membranes. Uh, it's our subcutaneous tissue under our skin. It is the universal packing tissue of the body. It's highly viscous. Um, it's viscous because it holds a lot of fluid and can retain a lot of fluid during infl inflammation. Remember, this is the packing tissue of our body, so it covers all of our important structures and can become inflamed to mediate um, some type of immune response. Because it can hold a lot of water, it acts as our fluid reservoir. It actually holds as much fluid as the blood, which is pretty crazy. So 
this can be a source of fluid for us, um, and this can be a place where we can store our fluid. It's a lot like molasses, the extracellular matrix. It's very thick. Um, white blood cells, which are very, uh, remember, in connective tissue, they are very common. There's a lot of white blood cells. Release a special enzyme that actually dissolves the extracellular matrix around them so they can swim around through it. And then this enzyme degrades and it re solidifies like molasses behind them. So they can move through this tissue very easily, which a lot of pro a lot of bacteria cannot. So it gives our white blood cells an advantage. They're fighting in their home territory type of thing because they can move and bacteria cannot. Unfortunately, a lot of different types of bacteria have adapted or uh, evolved or adapted this, this gene as well. So they produce the same enzyme. Uh, and those types of bacteria are obviously much much uh, have a much bigger advantage over other types of bacteria in terms of um, colonizing and starting infections in our connective tissue and in our body. So uh, basically areolar, um, this is the universal packing tissue of our body. It's very supportive, it's very thick, the extracellular matrix is very thick, and its primary cell type is going to be fibroblasts, maintaining all these extracellular fibers. All right, adipose. So we all know what adipose is. <laughs> it's, and some of us, it might be the most common connective tissue. I'm not sure. But um, it is, it's made up of adipocytes, or fat cells, basically. Um, it's similar to areolar tissue in structure. It's going to have uh, fibers, and, and it's going to be very dense. But it has a much higher nutrient storage capacity, much higher, and very, very limited water storage capacity. I, I don't know if this is true, this is just something I heard, but it makes sense to me. Um, one of my former professors asked us, what do you think, which tissue do you think stores the least amount of water? And I think pretty much everyone said bone. They didn't think bone would store a lot of water. But he said, no, it's fat. And if you remember from last week's class, that lip, lipids and water, which is polar, water is polar, lipids are nonpolar, do not like each other. They repel each other. So it makes sense that... Uh, fat tissue and fat cells would have the least amount of water. Anyway, so they have a high nutrient storage capacity. Makes sense, right? Because fat cells are filled with lipids. Uh, they're filled with this big droplet of lipids, which is almost pure triglyceride. Um, adipocytes or fat cells make up about 90% of the tissue's mass. So um, huge, 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 huge amount of fat cells and fat tissue because really it's not functioning to support something. It's just functioning to store nutrients. Um, we'll talk about white versus brown. It's on page 130. Basically, brown adipose is responsible for uh, producing heat before we really um, develop different ways to regulate our um, internal temperature as babies. It produces heat, and white is just a nutrient storage system. Uh, it's also, fat is also going to serve as an insulator to, it doesn't, heat doesn't transmit through it very well, um, so it will help to insulate our bodies, uh, and it serves as a, as a cushion, it's, it can serve as a cushion, it's around a lot of our organs, um, but primarily it's just an energy storage reservoir. I learned something, and this, again, this is something I'm not, I haven't read in a study or something, I don't know if this is true, but one of my teachers told it to me years ago. Um, that that how how your the number of fat cells you have when you're born is the number of fat cells you have for the rest of your life. So these cells can get really big. They can stretch and contain more and more and more fat. So um, when we gain weight, we're not actually uh, gaining new fat cells. They're just getting bigger until a certain point. At a certain point, they can start to divide. But we can't ever lose fat cells. This is what I was told. I don't know. So. Um, I, what the point of this, it was a nutrition class. The point of this was that when you are, um, when you're in the womb, basically the diet that your mother has actually will play a role in your likelihood of being obese as an adult, because if you're born with a lot of fat cells, if your mom eats a lot of unhealthy fatty foods and you're born with a lot of fat cells, you can't ever get rid of those fat cells. You can just shrink them. So, um, so when I found that out, I got mad at my mom. I had to give her a call. But anyway, so I thought that was interesting. But uh, adipose tissue, 
most leaf, it's 90% fat cells by mass. Um, it is a nutrient storage system. And it's, it is a part of loose connective tissue, and it falls within the connective tissue proper family. Reticular connective tissue. Okay, reticular connective tissue, lots of reticular fibers. Um, it also resembles areolar tissue, but it has only reticular fibers, no collagen or elastic fibers, elastin fibers. It also has fibroblasts, like all, loose, uh, like all connective tissue proper, but they're called reticular cells. Um, this is not a super common type of tissue. Remember, reticular fibers are in almost all connective tissue, but reticular tissue is not very common. Um, it forms an internal framework that supports and surrounds the lymph nodes, the spleen, and bone marrow. So these reticular fibers are in this spider webby type of thing that support all these small little tiny vessels of our lymph system and of our spleen and, uh, and our bone marrow. So that was it for loose connective tissue. So we have three types, areolar, adipose, and reticular. Now we're moving on to dense connective tissue. The first type being dense regular. Dense regular connective tissue. Um, here's a big, big difference from dense to loose. Remember we said that the big difference between connective tissue and epithelial tissue is that epithelial tissue is primarily made of cells and connective tissue is primarily made of extracellular matrix. Well, the previous the loose connective tissue is primarily matrix, but the difference is that there aren't a lot of fiber. I mean, there are fibers, but compared to dense connective tissue, there aren't a lot of fibers. The extracellular matrix of dense connective tissue is almost all fibers. Um, and in this particular type, dense regular connective tissue, these fibers are collagen fibers. Now, what's really unique and what gives this type of tissue its, uh, its properties are that these collagen fibers are running in parallel. They're running along the line of pull. This type of tissue makes up tendons. So it, may, it makes sense that it makes up tendons because it has bundles of collagen fibers running along parallel to each other along the line of pull. So it, makes, it gives them a ton of tensile strength. Um, so again, mostly fibers, but they do have some fibroblasts, but mostly fibers. It forms tendons, dense connective tissue forms tendons. And it also forms uh, ligaments, except ligaments have some more elastic tissue in them. So there's a little bit of slack in these collagen fibers. So once that slack is taken up, that's it. It's not going to stretch like elastic tissue. It's very strong. It has a lot of tensile strength, which is why it forms our tendons. Um, it is poorly vascularized, however. So injuries here take a long time to heal. Um, it gets all of its nutrition from, from the extracellular matrix and surrounding fluids. So... Dense, connective, dense regular connective tissue. Mostly collagen fibers, some fibroblasts, but these collagen fibers run in one direction. They run parallel to each other along the line of pull. All right, dense irregular. So regular, their fibers ran in one direction. In, ir in dense irregular tissue, the fibers run in irregular directions. They run in all different directions. So another way of saying is this: saying this is the collagen is irregularly organized, hence the name irregular. Mm, this is in the dermis. Um, so the just under our epidermis, under underneath the stratified squamous uh, epithelium of our epidermis is this dense irregular tissue, um, and also this is found in the fibrous capsules of our joints and our organs. Okay, it makes sense. Because unlike uh, dense regular, which is strong in one direction, this is strong in many directions. Uh, maybe not as strong as, it, you know, you wouldn't want to make a tendon up out of this, but you want all the collagen fibers parallel in a tendon. But in a structure that you want strength in all different directions, like the dermis of your skin or these fibrous joint capsules, you want a tissue that isn't only strong in one direction. It's strong in multiple directions. So, and it's strong in multiple directions because the collagen is irregularly organized. All right, last type, elastic. This is not as common as the, as the previous two, but look at, look at this picture of the tissue on the bottom left. It's pretty cool. Look at those elastic fibers. They're, they're squiggly. So what, what that means is that it can expand. 
this elastic tissue can expand. And when, when that expansive force isn't there anymore, pressure or whatever, they will recoil. This is really important in um, arteries, in larger arteries. You want a tissue that will allow these arteries to expand under high pressure, but then recoil when the pressure drops. This will help regulate your blood pressure. Um, basically, things I want you to remember about this, lots of elastic fibers, right? Not much collagen or articular fibers, lots of elastic fibers. And this will make up your arteries and some uh, vertebral ligaments. All right, so that's it for connective tissue proper. Recap, connective tissue proper is made up of loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. Loose connective tissue is made up of areolar, reticular, and adipose tissue. Um, dense connective tissue is made up of dense regular, dense irregular, and elastic, um, dense elastic connective tissue. Now we're moving on to a new family of connective tissues, cartilage. There are three types of cartilage. Um, this, this first type of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, is the most abundant. But before I get into that, let's just talk about cartilage in general. Uh, cartilage is avasculator and non-innervated. So you don't, you're not going to feel a lot from this tissue. This tissue isn't going to have many or any sensory information, which is good because this is a site of joint articulation. You, that would be very painful all the time if this had sensory receptors in it. Um, also, it's avascular. So damage here will be very slow to regenerate. Um, lar there are large amounts of collagen in hyaline cartilage. Makes sense because this is a supportive tissue that you want to be strong against tension and compress against tension. But it also is made up of 80% fluid. 80% fluid. Um, why? What's the, that? Doesn't seem like that makes sense, right? Fluid is not strong. Well, here's the thing: if you remember from physics, fluid cannot be compressed. Okay. Fluid cannot be compressed. That's why hydraulics work so well. Uh, fluid cannot be compressed. So not only will cartilage resist tension because of its collagen, it will resist compression because of its water, its fluid. That's very important in the structure that uh, is between our joints. It has to resist compression all day long. The structure of cartilage is somewhere in between that of bone and dense connective tissue. Okay. Um, somewhere between bone and dense connective tissue. So unlike bone, it's going to have lots of fibers and things in it, uh, but it has a lot of fluid and, um, and is going to resist compression. Uh, and its extracellular matrix is very, very dense. So, okay, let's, let's move into hyaline cartilage. Um, it's the most abundant type. Again, large amounts of collagen. It's only one to 10% chondrocytes. And these chondrocytes organize in little clusters called lacunae because of how thick and dense the, uh, the extracellular matrix is. And that's in the picture, you can see them in little clusters. Um, hyaline cartilage is going to have this glassy white-blue appearance, almost like the picture. When, you, when we see it in lab, it actually looks a lot like that. Um, we want it to be glassy and smooth, so a lot of friction and heat and wear isn't created when our joints move. Um, it resists compression. Highland cartilage to resist compression, which makes sense why it is our articular cartilage. It is a cartilage at all our articular surfaces and bone ends. It also makes up our uh, attachments of our ribs to our sternum, and a few and is found a few other places in the body. But the big the big deal is the articular. It is our articular cartilage because of its ability to resist compression, um, resist tension, and be very smooth. All right. Elastic cartilage. So the book describes elastic cartilage as being nearly identical to hyaline cartilage, except that it has more elastic fibers in it. Okay. Um, so basically, this can deform and recoil better than better than hyaline cartilage. The only two examples that I know of, there's probably more, but are the external ear, the the cartilage supporting our external ear and the cartilage forming or epiglottis. These are both structures that we can bend and that can move, but then recoil. Unless you're a wrestler or something, then your ears are, are, are messed up. But um, elastic cartilage forms these structures that can be bent and then return to their shape. And it's a lot like hyaline, just more elastic fibers.
Okay, fiber cartilage. Uh, this is in structure. Remember, these are all connective tissues. So in structure, this is somewhere in between hyaline cartilage and dense regular connective tissue. Um, there's there's bundles of collagen fibers, and then chondrocytes. So there's lines of chondrocytes and lines of collagen fibers. It's alternated. It almost looks kind of striated in the picture. You can see that. There's lines of cells and then bundles of collagen. This is going to resist compression and tension uh, very well, actually. So the, the big difference here is that this is a very fibrous type of cartilage. It can resist a lot of tension. Um, it has a lot of collagen in it. We're going to find this in places like that we need to resist a lot of compression and tension, like our intervertebral discs and the menisci in our knee. Okay, so all of our intervertebral discs between our vertebrae, which we'll learn about this week in lab, are made up of fibrocartilage, as is the, uh, the pubic symphysis. There's a fibrocartilaginous disc in between our two um, oscoxae bones, or our two anonymates. Uh, we'll talk about that soon in lab as well. All right, so that's it for cartilage. We have hyaline, fibrocartilage, uh, and elastic cartilage. Now let's talk about bone. There are actually a few subtypes of bone, but we don't get into it here. We're just going to be looking at compact bone. Um, compact bone, it, it support, or bone in general, or skeleton in general, supports our body, protects our body, our ribs protect our organs, for example, um, and probably most importantly, it serves as attachments for muscles. So it gives our body a way to move. Our muscles attach to our bones, and then our muscles move our bones around. Uh, another huge, um, actually maybe even more important part of bones, that, or function of bones that we don't think about often, is as a mineral reservoir. So calcium, for example, is very important in muscle and heart and nerve function. So if we're low on calcium, all the body has to do is release some parathyroid hormone and osteoclasts break down calcium from our bones and release it into the blood. If we're bringing in a surplus of calcium, it will be deposited in our bones for later use. It's very sim The extracellular matrix is very similar to, car similar to cartilage, except that calcium has been deposited. Calcium salts are deposited on the matrix. So the, the fibers and extracellular matrix is like a rebar network, and then um, calcium is laid down like cement, making it very strong, resist compression and tension. The, uh, the, the fibers resist the tension, and the bone salts resist the compression, just like concrete. It is highly vascular. So you want to think of bone as being highly vascular, but it is. Bone will heal quickly. It's highly vascular. Um, blood is made in the bone marrow, so this gives it a way out of the bone as well as if we need to pick up calcium from our bones, um, it's easy to do because they're highly vascular. Their bone itself isn't highly innervated, but the periosteum, what surrounds our bones, is very, very highly innervated and very sensitive. So any break or tear in the periosteum or break in a bone is very, very painful. Uh, bone also, also stores fat and produces blood cells. It's made up of... Um, well, the, sorry, the cells within bone tissue are osteocytes and osteoblasts. And the functional unit of bone is the osteon. I'm not going to talk about that on here. Maybe I'll talk about it a little in class, but we have a whole chapter on bone, so I'll wait, I'll wait till then. All right, blood. So it doesn't really seem like a connective tissue, but, I mean, it, do, it does connect all the different parts of our body. It gives it a transport system to move nutrients, move waste, move gases. Um, it is composed of, just like all connective tissue, cells and extracellular matrix. Um, blood cells, all different types of blood cells, red and white blood cells and platelets, are surrounded by matrix, blood plasma. And this blood plasma contains proteins and different uh, fibrin molecules and different things. So it, it is a connective tissue, it's just uh, very different, and it does arise from the mesenchyme. So, so it, it meets all the criteria of being a connective tissue. Uh, blood, I mean, we, we all know where, what blood is and what its purpose is. It moves, it transports gases um, through the capillaries and wastes and, and picks up waste and deposits nutrients through the capillaries uh, everywhere in our body. Even, even our avascular tissue, like epithelial tissue and um, 
cartilage relies on the nutrients from the blood. It's just going to diffuse instead of, instead of, uh, for example, epithelial tissue. The nutrients are just going to diffuse to the cell instead of being directly vascularized. But blood supplies all of our body's tissues with nutrients and gases. All right, so that is it for connective tissue. So all, I, all we have left are is ugh, can't talk. Sorry, all we have left is muscle tissue and nervous tissue. There are three types of muscle tissue. Um, let me make sure there's nothing special I want to say before I go on. Nope. Okay. So three types: skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. So these names give a lot away. Skeletal muscle is going to have its origin and insertion on the skeleton on osseous tissue or osseous connective tissue. Cardiac muscle is going to form the heart and uh, has its own whole entirely different system for innervation and the rhythm at which it beats and the tissue itself is actually very different from skeletal muscle. Um, and then we have smooth muscle which gets this name from its lack of striation. If you look at skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle there's this striation that comes from the actin and myosin bands in the sarcomere which we'll learn about again in the muscle chapter. Uh, it, smooth muscle doesn't have that, so it looks smooth. So uh, cardiac muscle, again, we'll find in the heart. Smooth muscle we'll find uh, in all of our hollow organs and other parts of the body, like our stomach and intestines. Uh, basic, Just some basic differences I'd like you guys to know. Skeletal muscle is under our conscious control. It's innervated by our the motor component of our somatic nervous system. It's striated because of this actin myosin cross bridging at the sarcomere level, and it is multinucleate. Each muscle cell has many nuclei, and uh, that's necessary because some muscle cells are a couple feet long. You know, they form these long fibers. Thousands of them come together and are bound by are bound by connective tissue together in fascicles. And uh, they are under conscious control and can contract. Um, there's some other stuff I want to talk about in lecture, but at, well, maybe we'll get to it. We'll see. Uh, cardiac muscle, on the other hand, is not under our conscious control. And it is uninucleate. So each cell has one nucleus. That's the big difference between skeletal and cardiac muscle. Also, it has these special gap junctions called intercalated discs, which means that the muscles are not electrically separated. So when an action potential or an impulse is developed, it's going to spread throughout the tissue. This is different than skeletal muscle. So here, think about this for a second. Um, when we, when say, say I'm holding a five pound weight in my hand with my elbow flexed to 90 degrees. So it's like I'm doing a bicep curl and I stopped halfway. Actually, say it's a one pound weight, for example. Muscle... Muscle tissue contracts in, in sort of an all-or-none type of fashion. So, so in order to in order to hold a one-pound weight in my hand versus a twenty-pound weight in my hand, I won't really be adjusting how hard my muscle is contracting. I'll be adjusting how many muscle fibers are contracting. So, when I'm holding a one-pound weight, maybe a thousand muscle fibers are contracting. When I'm holding a ten-pound weight, maybe three thousand muscle fibers are contracting. I have no idea if those numbers are way off, but I'm just saying there's going to be a difference in the amount of muscles contracting. These are called motor units. All right, This can happen because my, my skeletal muscle fibers are electrically separated from each other. Okay, So I can contract some, but not others. In the heart, that can't happen because they are electrically connected through these intercalated discs or gap junctions. All right, So that's another big difference. Smooth muscle is completely different from the other two. It uses it doesn't have sarcomeres as its functional unit. Um, it uses this interesting sort of actin myosin like spider web around the cell. It's 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 pretty interesting. We'll talk about that later when we get to the muscle chapter though. All right, last but not least, um, nervous tissue. So nervous tissue is made up of neurons or nerve cells and glial cells, which are supporting cells. Uh, which accomplish all different sorts of functions, whether it be establishing the brain-blood barrier or uh, myel myelination of the axons, um, and they're just they just serve in a supporting role. Uh, neurons themselves are made up of a cell body, which has dendrites coming off of it, which receive signals, 
and then a long tail called an axon um, with axon terminals and boutons are called at the end of the axon which transmit signals to other dendrites or to glands or to muscle or to all different types of effector sites. Uh, nervous tissue, I mean, this is this is where all of our higher level brain functions occur, this is where all of our uh, all our thought processes occur, all of our functions that um, control homeostasis originate here. Very, very important tissue. We'll have, I think, three or four chapters on different parts of the nervous system. So I won't get onto it too much here, but nervous system, uh, its function is to control other parts of the body. All right, study guide. I'll put it online Wednesday. Hopefully that's my goal. Um, I went, flew through this stuff. Uh, just a very, I didn't want to do another three hour, a three hour one like I did with the cell. So got it done in about an hour. That was my goal. Um, quick recap, and this is just from the top of my head. I'm not looking at a quiz or anything, but uh, four general types of tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, uh, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. There are subtypes within each of those. I want you guys to know those, what they're composed of primarily, some of the basic differences between the different types of tissue. For example, um, elastic connective tissue has elastic, a lot more elastic fibers. Um, dense regular connective tissue has collagen fibers running in parallel, which lends it uh, towards um, composing structures like tendons and ligaments, things like that. I also want you to know just the very basic roles of these tissues. So epithelial tissue is a covering and lining interface tissue that absorbs, secretes, protects, cushions. Uh, connective tissue, sorry, epithelial tissue doesn't support, you're rid of that one. <laughs> connective tissue, it's supportive. It, it uh, holds things, holds organs. It composes a basement membrane underneath our um, epithelial tissue, things like that. Uh, nervous tissue obviously controls and innervates all these other tissues and glands and organs, and muscle tissue moves our body, it, whether it be our digestive system, our heart, our skeletal movements, things like that. Um, in lecture, I'm going to get probably I'll probably get in a bit more to the different cell types and things. I'm not sure yet. Uh, we'll see. But in the meantime, like I don't know if you've heard, but I'm internet less until Wednesday, so I'm going to try to get as much stuff typed up as I can and then post it all on Wednesday, so you guys will be ready for the quiz one week from today on Chapter 4, Tissues. All right, thanks for listening, guys. See you tonight.